It's a real pleasure to have Francis come and present to us today. Um, so, um, is it Sandy? You're, well, I've forgotten your name, sorry, immediately. You, you talked about yourself as a baby, Sophie? Sophie. Mm. Talked about yourself as a baby <laughs> academic. Sophie. So, Sophie. Um, Francis might also talk about herself as being a baby academic, having recently completed her PhD, but she has a very long history of um, this kind of work and the kind of work that she did in her thesis too, of writing, um, you know, working closely with those people who we might, we might call research participants, but that Francis calls co-authors. Mm. And maybe some other words as well that she'll tell mm. us about, I don't know. Um, so a really close, um, deep, collaborative kind of work. So it's um, a lot of depth of experience that's behind this, mm. uh, this work that Francis is going to talk about today. So in terms of talking about what you do, I, I can't really describe exactly what you do in terms of the, you know, the work. But I know mm. Francis is involved in various kinds of contract research. Mm. Um, and got many, her finger in many mm. pies, research pies. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'll just hand it over to you. Welcome, Francis. Mm. Nā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa, nā mihi aroha nui ki a koe Avril and ki a koe Esther. Thank you for inviting me to come and present today. Ko Mangari te Mauna, ko Manako te Awa, ko Irish Pākehā te Iwi, Ko Mangari Bridge to Papakainga, uh, Ko Francis Aho. This presentation is as much about relationships to a particular place, Otara, and its peoples, as it is about an academic topic, negotiating the ethics and politics of co authorship in collaborative community text making. And I really don't think I could find room for another word on that title. <laughs> a lot in there. So even those of you who are far away, um, I'm sure, um, have heard of Ōtara. It's situated in South Auckland and is home to predominantly Māori and Pacific Island peoples and communities. Ōtara is often cast in a negative light. If you're from Ōtara, chances are you have your back against the wall ready to defend yourself against negative perceptions. I lived in Ōtara in my youth and in other communities like it, so I feel a heart connection to this place. I also feel a heart connection to its peoples, a sense of comfort and joy and enjoyment when I'm with them, even though we are so different from each other in many ways. And after all of these years, I'm 57 now, I still know so little about their rich, beautiful cultures. I am a member of our country's dominant Pākehā culture, so inevitably I see life through that dominant lens. I'm also a beneficiary of many forms of white privilege, and I have had access to opportunities that are so much harder to reach if you are a Māori or Samoan kid growing up in Ōtara. In this presentation, I focus on a book project that tells a counter story of this community from the perspective of some of its members. The images you see are taken from the book. Here, I focus spe specifically on how to represent the authorship of a book produced in a collaborative community storytelling project. What do the words with and and represent when included in a list of co-authors? How should I represent my own authorial work? What sorts of ethical political issues arise for a researcher of a dominant culture working with indigenous and under-resourced communities? Questions of representation create ethical political um, dilemmas for researchers, whoever they are, working with indigenous peoples and groups and under-resourced communities. The Academy expects researchers to address such matters upfront through clear-cut ethical protocols. I absolutely think there must be ethical protocols to guide research. After all, as Linda Tuhiwai-Smith said, so profoundly, 
Research is probably one of the dirtiest words in the indigenous world's vocabulary. But really, is my research work with these communities clear cut? And often it is impossible to predict exactly what will happen. I'm part of a book project at the moment on indigenous and non-indigenous relationship building in the United States. That project has been going on for 10 years. Three contributing co-authors have died. We have plotted our way through significant challenges, a number of drafts, and endured many publisher rejections. This year, finally, the very prestigious University of Toronto Press yeah. agreed to publish that book and they are completely excited about it. My work requires faith, flexibility, fidelity to relationships and patience. Those relational qualities and the challenges that call them forth are not easily accommodated on a university ethics application. Mm. So here are um, three examples of, of books that I've um, written that share something of the ethical, political terrain of my work. And when I came to the Ōtara project, which is the focus of this discussion, I really thought that having worked with communities for over 25 years to tell their stories, that I was reasonably well versed in the ethical, political dilemmas surrounding co-authorship. My first book um, on the top left-hand corner was a collection of conversations with Gisotonamu, a Wampanoag ceremonial keeper in the United States, where I studied, lived and worked for a number of years. We spent four years discussing the impossibilities of working together given the oppressive ongoing effects of colonisation. He was at the time and still is living on a Mi'kmaq reservation in Canada. So those effects are, are very apparent. Finally, one day, Gisotonamuk said that what mattered most to him was the fact that we had, in his eyes, become family. So it was on that basis that we decided fairly immediately just to get on with it. And in six short weeks, we produced a manuscript of a little book of rich conversations called A Note Show. Our publisher was a white ally and ethicist, and she recommended that we use and to represent the authorship of that text. It was a work we completed together. We needed each other to make it happen, and it materialized unique interests that we each brought to that project. Because it documented Gisotonamuk's knowledge, it was very much his book he wanted it written. He had the final say on the text and his name went first. I didn't really understand what being a first author meant at that time, I must add. And frankly, I was just so excited to have my name on a book and that book in particular. I did um, what I, a good Irish girl has been raised to do, which is to do what I was told. Um, and looking back, I think it was our editor who was quite prescient in making that decision, because after all these years, it still feels like the right one for us both. My subsequent apprenticeship with David Epstein, a narrative scholar, led me to produce collective storied accounts, books and case stories that attributed lead authorship to the group I was working with and myself. That and privileged their position as the authorities on their experiences. On some projects, I worked with as many as 25 individual co-researchers, a term I will discuss shortly, associated with a group. Turopu Manawanui was a group of nan nannies and papas living in Wellington with diabetes, and they wanted to share their experiences and knowledges um, with others. Um, on the inside cover of many of these sorts of projects, I came to include the names of all my co-researchers, usually in alphabetical order. Their names, so far as I could tell, added mana to the work, regardless of their role or position in society. 
Also, many of my co-researchers would never have otherwise gotten their name on a book. And I have found over the years that people are just as thrilled as I am about seeing their name listed on a book as a co-author. I think co-creating that thrilling experience for someone is a privilege. Finally, the Ties book evolved during three years of work in Auckland uh, with a community, the Tamaki community, where I worked with 10 community leaders engaged in a major community-led initiative. The book documents community knowledges and stories on good engagement, really how they wanted to engage with the government because the government's uh, you know, been very active in their community. I wrote that book work, working very closely with an editorial group of three of the co-authors. Um, and um, when it came to determine the authorship, it really was a challenge. Um, we had all worked so hard um, on that project, it became abundantly clear to me that what mattered the most was the collective. I was given, you know, the responsibility to determine that authorship, um, which I presented and discussed and people embraced. And so the name Ty's team, as we became known, um, is on the front cover. All our names are on the inside cover. Um, because, you know, I just thought we all had a hand in making that book possible. And while I wrote the words, I wrote them out of just very many conversations we had together over those years. I'd have to say that working outside of the academy on mainly self-published works with communities has offered tremendous freedom to do whatever the hell we wanted. But it has also come with significant isolation because often we were just making it up. And probably I would go back to some of the, the books or stories that I've written and I might attribute authorship differently now that I know a bit more. So much could be said about all of that. So, in my work, I seek to enact a decolonizing research um, practice. Like the educational researcher Lee Patel, I view research as a relational project which requires me to work closely with people, place, and texts. I'm challenged to focus on what matters most to the people I work with, and in the process, interweave ethical, political ideas and action through a decolonizing praxis. In the Otara book project, which is the subject of this presentation, I made myself answerable to a particular group of people, a particular place, and what became an evolving text. Lee Patel suggests that answerability is a way for researchers to sustain the coming into being with, being in conversation with their co-researchers by being responsible, accountable, and part of an exchange. Also aware, as Foucault reminds, that power is always operating, I exercised again in this project a willingness to enter those rich fields of ethical uncertainty that in fact characterise so much of the qualitative research I do with Indigenous peoples and other communities. I, we, addressed questions, quandaries, ambivalences and tensions as they arose in situ in the research, allowing different perspectives, contextual factors, and developing interests to be considered. In the process, the project was co-designed and redesigned as we went by those engaged in it. My work generally, um, but also in the Ōtara book project specifically, also seeks to interweave narrative ideas and prax practices with a decolonizing praxis. The Māori educational philosopher and scholar Russell Bishop recognises a Māori pre preference for narrative practice. Obviously, for me, working in ways that work for Māori is crucial to stopping research exploitation of their knowledges. Avril and Takawaho Hoskins have written beautifully about the need for Pākehā to demonstrate humility in response to Māori generosity to engage 
and research projects. And um, the more I do this work, I recognise that that humility is a recognition of the asymmetries of power in the relationship. A co-research approach focuses on doing research together. In the Otara book project, the people I worked with were my co-researchers, not my informants, a term I find most objectionable. Um, or even my participants. As the authorities on their experience, they became, in my eyes, my co-authors in our collaborative research enterprise. Co-research required me to listen for stories, as the American writer Eudora Welty would say, and co-construct knowledge and meaning in order to co-produce rich, performative, developing texts. I had to work in a way that would preserve the spirit and integrity of the stories told to me and care for them as they found their way with my assistance into a written text. Arthur Frank, the Canadian sociologist, highlights the ethical, political, and moral work that stories do. In this project, I sought to co-produce a counter-story of Ōtara that would summon respect for the ethical, political commitments of my co-researchers and resist and repair the oppressive identities imposed on Ōtara. So, the Ōtara book. In 2013, I was commissioned to write an eight-page paper on the origins and commitments of an organisation called the High Tech Youth Network. The organisation began life in an Ōtara shed and over 10 years grew into a network of high-tech studios across New Zealand and the South Pacific. These studios offer innovative educational opportunities to ethnically diverse learners aged from eight to 25 years, living in under-resourced or geographically remote communities. At the time that I came into this project, the network hub was based at Kiaroha College in Ōtara. The high-tech studios provide a place to gather that allows youth to do amazing things with technology, like build computers. The network also combines digital technologies with strengthening cultural identity of youth so they can stand tall in the world and respond to its challenges and its opportunities on the basis of who they are culturally. Over the next two years, the assignment developed into a beautifully designed 180-page book. I co-authored a multi-genre text of prose, poetry and wisdom with a group of Ōtara giants and guardians. In this context, those references talk about elders or members of the next generation who are exercising forms of leadership. My personal connections to Ōtara and how this project evolved led me to rethink the ethics and politics of co-authorship in community st storytelling projects those familiar authorial signposts with and and challenged me in unexpected ways. Here I was challenged to find a way to make clear to a community audience who had authored the work, both the book as a whole and the prose, poetry and wisdom in it, so that the community would know who said this in the process, I had to figure out how to represent my own authorial work. Where we start from. Our po is where we start from. We start with who we are. Why is it important for us to include who we are? Because it's important to the community. They want to know who said this. Māori concepts shaped the vision for the storytelling project. 
the network's chief executive, Mike Usma, wanted me to record its whakapapa, its origins and genealogy, as well as its ihi, the sustaining energies. Put simply, what it is that drives us. Mike named the community giants Matua Sam Chapman and Dr Anne Milne as the keepers of this knowledge and guardians of the High Tech Youth Network. Both are well known in their respective fields of community development and education. Mike, the chief executive, envisioned a taonga, a treasure made through artistry. If you write a report on our whakapapa, there will be no ihi, he said. But if you write our whakapapa as poetry, it will write itself beautifully because it will have a life. Mike also had ideas about my research positioning. Seeing myself through his eyes, I was neither an outside observer nor an independent researcher writer. Instead, I was an otara girl and therefore Fano. He expected me to reflect on the influence of my Otara connections on my work in this project, as well as the impact on me of working with its guardians. Over long leisurely visits, I enjoyed deep conversations with Sam and Anne about what truly matters to them, the well-being and future of Māori and Pacific kids. When I asked them, how should I reconstruct our conversations in text so your voices can be heard? They each said, preserve the integrity of diverse voices and be truthful. Well, that was not exactly a blueprint. Mm -hmm. Inspired by the work of the Uruguay writer and social critic, Eduardo Galeano, I reproduced what I considered to be conversational touchstones as prose and wisdom. I also crafted poetry from some of our conversations. In compiling the text, I paid attention to what the North American writer Annie Dillard calls the possibilities for meaning and feeling. After years of writing community stories, I think those possibilities create a sense of beauty. An intensive editorial process over some months involving the giants led them to authenticating the original individual contributions presented in their names. I often referred to Galliano's reflections on his engagement with Cedric Belfrage, the translator with whom he worked over many years. Introducing his masterful creation, The Book of Embraces, Galliano said, I would recognize myself in each of his translations. I hoped my co-authors would also recognize themselves in my translations of our conversations and that the people who knew them best in the community would also recognize them, hear their voices, relish their wisdom and feel pride in their relational connections. In this project, I did not digitally record our conversations. I worked off my handwritten interview notes, which is something I've done for years. Galliano reminded me of the definition of recordar, to remember, from the Latin recordis, to pass back through the heart. Here then, I sought to not only remember the conversations whole and entire, if not word for word, but also to invite their meanings and feelings to pass back through my heart on their way to what I now realized could never be an eight page paper, but which I hoped could become a truly collaborative book. When Sam and Anne saw the first draft of the manuscript, they were thrilled, but they also sensed a missing link. They asked me to include the voices of the younger generation of high-tech youth network guardians. So overnight, two co-authors became six. And here, um, next to Sam and Anne, you have Mike on the top right-hand corner, Mike Osma, the chief executive. Kane Milne, who's Māori, he is um, Anne's son. Q 
Ku Iorangi, who identifies as Māori and Cook Islands, and Darling Philomone, um, uh, Tima Toi, who is a Matai um, and a Samoan. So I then went off and had conversation, long, deep conversations with them. When I situated their voices next to their revered mentors, suddenly the emerging manuscript felt more complete to everyone. Mato Sam gave the book its title, Otara, where ancient and new technologies meet. I worked with a talented designer, Linton Rowling, to create its look and feel. Choosing appropriate imagery was hugely challenging due to cultural considerations, diverse perspectives and individual preferences. Some of what we considered to be the best photos we had to discard because we didn't have permission to use them for this purpose. But when the final designs arrived, there was a feeling of excitement and awe. I have to say that um, this was all done under huge pressure. The book had sat idle, the manuscript had, had sat idle for a year because there was no money to publish it. Um, they were having a 10 year anniversary and Mike said, well, if we don't get the money, I'll sell my car. And overnight, um, we all scrambled into action to get the third um, draft of the manuscript completed and the book designed. Um, it was only then when I paused um, to consider how to represent the authorial contributions to this community storytelling project, I was a member, remember, I was a member of the dominant Pākehā culture, documenting Indigenous knowledges, seeking to operate within a decolonising frame, positioning community colleagues as co-researchers and co-authors and actively working with their words. So the decision was always going to be easy, right? I don't know if you can see the top of that, but representing authorship. So I already, because I'd been doing this work for so many years, I'd already kind of developed an approach to authorship that was shaped by um, my earlier apprentice, David Epstein. Um, and we've, we've already written about um, this in another ch book chapter. Um, while working together on a community visioning um, project, David proposed ethics of respect, generosity and accuracy for co-authorship. Respect for the source of knowledges and each person's contribution. Generosity in authorship, including consultation and due consideration of joint authorship if and when an intention arises to publish from the project or present at conferences, and accuracy when citing all materials, including progress reports and other documents and notes generated through the project. In previous projects, rather than claiming authorial ownership, these ethical political reminders called me to practice accountability for the community stories and knowledges invested in me. I had developed a habit of writing narratives in the first person plural, we, as if communities were speaking for themselves, albeit through my pen, but also included um, stories and insights of individuals to reflect the diversity of thinking among them. In earlier books, I included my research reflections as part of the text, which when doing my doctorate, I realized that Bourdieu was a great advocate of these. He thought that if you did this, it allowed readers to appreciate um, the intentions um, of the author and researcher and in a sense create a self-reliant text that didn't need to be interpreted because there was a, a work that was whole and entire. Um, I also assigned authorship to a specific group of storytellers and myself because the preposition with, frankly, seemed to me then, weak, ambiguous, and possibly demeaning. But the Otara book was different. It wasn't a collective account. It was a multi-genre text of prose, poetry, and wisdom composed in individual voices. So I needed a different approach. With Mike's encouragement, I consulted my university colleagues. 
Professor Alison Jones, Dr. Takawaho Hoskins, and Elizabeth Wilkinson. They agreed that a decision had to be made in situ what worked best for this book and these co authors, with one proviso follow your heart and your intuition, Takawaho said. Liz Wilkinson is the subject librarian at Tupunawananga um, in the Faculty of Education at Auckland University. Um, and she is really a tremendously wonderful person. Um, she reminded me that the front cover of a book is a marketing exercise designed to sell books and attract readers, and we shouldn't be too romantic about it. In this case, the people of Ōtara, here's the book cover, um, and the high-tech youth membership were always the first audience. It wasn't about producing a bestseller, but rather circulating a text within a community and through a network. By naming the genres of prose, poetry and wisdom on the top right-hand corner of the cover, we hope the book might appeal to different readers. Bearing in mind that some readers in our communities are highly challenged and um, uh, that was another reason why Galliano's approach really appealed to me because it allowed for a lot of white space through the text. One of the most rewarding um, comments I received from a reader actually was from Matua Sam's brother who had never read a book until he read this book and he sat down and over the course of a couple of days, read it from cover to cover. And when Mato Sam tried to get him to come and do something with him, he growled him and said, no, I'm reading this book. <laughs> so the idea of making reading possible for people who struggle with it was hugely um, attractive to me. My co-authors were known locally and their names on the cover would also attract attention and embody the work with their mana. We agreed to list the giants in alphabetical order, which felt really um, serendipitous, um, but right and proper um, in respect of Matua Sam and his huge standing and his indigenous status in this country. Um, and also with regard to the younger generations of guardians, um, we listed them in the order in which they became involved in the network. So they're not in alphabetical order. But that was a quirky style mix that worked for that group of co-authors. My name on the bottom right-hand corner of the cover represented my responsibility for the whole work. The Māori iconography, Pacific weave and gorgeous cover colour reflected the vibrancy and diversity of the community and the network. Now, of course, I look at this cover and I also see its flaws. Where is the missing Macron over the O, o in Ōtara? <laughs> that is a long O. And the font size and the font colours for our names and the titles are inadequate. But that's what you get with self-published works. Somehow, in this discussion, we had avoided the with and dilemma altogether. However, when representing the authorship on the inside cover, we face new dilemmas. Liz advised that the inside title page is where the attribution of authorship becomes more critical for other audiences. Librarians, academics and publishers use this page for cataloguing and referencing. Academic discourse places huge weight on first author distinctions. For years, I didn't know this. In this project, we needed a form of authorship that included everyone. That was really our preeminent um, concern. We needed to re respect our different contributions and demonstrate that the text was a responsibility shared and had to be for the giants and guardians to have a rightful sense of ownership of the book as its co-authors. Here we decided on with. I'm listed as the first author who produced a whole text that was co-produced with a group of co-authors. 
why choose with? With symbolizes our collaboration, a kind of joining in which individuals come into the company of one another with their particular interests, and in this case, make different contributions that collectively co-produce a book. This with, here symbolizing a joint work, is only possible because, as Alison Jones suggests, the notion of with is always already imperfect and rich in possibilities. In other words, with is confusing, and so it should be. This humble preposition suggests an authorial curiosity, willing to wrestle with ambivalences and be open to new interpretations. But the matter of authorship wasn't settled. Remember, the giants wanted the community to know who said this. Representing the authorship of the prose and wisdom in the book pro presented its own challenge. This prose and wisdom re represented the knowledge of my Otara colleagues. I had a critical role in co-producing their prose and wisdom through narrative inquiry, and in working with their words, I had compiled this text. But I also appreciated that its rich store of knowledge really belonged to them. Here, my heart and intuition came into play. While I had helped to make their words as clear as they could be, I felt strongly that my co-authors already owned their merits. And they agreed. Putting their names on the page made clear to the community who said this. Representing the authorship of the poetry was a different matter, however. Something niggled. Did your co-authors write these poems? Liz Wilkinson, my university librarian colleague, asked. No, I replied, I wrote them. Their words passed through my heart and I reworked them as they traveled into text, adding some of my own words until I had created a poem. Looking through a Western ethical frame from a librarian's perspective, Liz pointed out the obvious. It wasn't obvious to me at the time. Francis, poems are their own works. If you do not claim some authorial contribution, you could mislead the reader. Was it your intention to practice an ethics of absence, she asked? No, I said. My intention was to be humble, that is, respectful, accurate, and generous. I was shocked that Liz was calling my ethics into question when I was trying so hard to enact decolonizing politics by recognizing my co-author's contributions. I should tell you, going off script, <laughs> that I've got a reputation for integrity when it comes to ethics mm -hmm. in the book writing projects that I do. So, you know, to have someone come along and question my ethics mm -hmm. was quite a shock. I wanted my Otara colleagues to have proper authorial recognition for their ideas, but in striving for this, I had lost sight of my own unique contribution. Surely, Liz argued, the poet deserves her own recognition. I wrote to Anne, one of the giants, about the dilemma of how to attribute authorship of the poems in the book. What is troubling my mind is not ethics, but politics. I have done everything I could in my power to do to observe a Māori ethic of tika, doing what is right and proper in the situation. That doesn't mean I didn't say or do things that I could have said or done better. I can always do better. But what's causing my, me strife is the politics at play, in particular the way community and indigenous knowledges have been and are commonly treated, usurped, stolen, plagiarised, diminished or disregarded as a form of knowledge. 
But we didn't write those poems or the book, Anne replied. You were the writer who created something beautiful with our words. I was being challenged to look through another lens. Anne's comments echoed Liz's wisdom. Works are created. Creators are ancestors of the work. Conversely, the work is an offspring. In the whakapapa of a work, one wouldn't omit an ancestor. I was beginning to see that seeking to practice a politics of ethics had led me to an act, an ethics of absence. I had to find a way to practice a different form of humility, one that knows its own measure, not authorial absence, but authorial presence. I remembered Matua Sam's words when he saw the first draft of the book. Through your pen and your heart, you have added so much value to who we are, he said. Yes, I thought, their value already existed. And I had added to it. Without knowing it, Sam had the final say on who authored the poems. The authorship form of the poems became Matua Sam Chapman and Francis Hancock. In the book I wrote, the knowledge in this book belongs to the giants and guardians, yet I am also imprinted in it. I carry responsibility for the production of the whole work, which was undertaken with and authorised by them, sometimes as an obvious presence in crafting what I heard as their poetry, and other times seemingly invisible but living, and caring for what I heard as their prose and their wisdom. Any failure to create a symphony of voices in this text is mine alone. The struggle over authorship is never simple and came about in this case because I wanted, wanted to embody a decolonizing narrative praxis that meant focusing on what mattered most to my co-researchers and making myself answerable to them, ethically and politically. In this project, I was answerable to three particular relationships. First, my relationship with Otara. I realised I was still an Otara girl. Our life as a family was hard back then and I had a transient childhood. So I don't know actually how long I lived in Otara and no one in my family can tell me. Working on the book restored my relationship to this place and allowed me to feel pride in my connections to it. I didn't feel pride when I lived there as a teenager. I felt ashamed to live in Otara because Otara was one of those terrible places that some people lived in. Some people still see Otara like that. Our shared purpose was always to craft a counter story that would resist the oppressive identities imposed upon Otara and command respect for the vision and commitments of a group of its leaders. And we did that. Second, I was answerable to my Otara colleagues. Our loyalties to one another deepened as we worked together on what the ethnographer Eric Lassiter calls the developing text. In this case, three major drafts over two years, which became, as Lassiter puts it, the centrepiece of an evolving, ongoing conversation. Over time, we revisited and reinterpreted matters of importance as we co-produced knowledge and meaning. As a material object, the book's beauty symbolises the relationships made possible through relational research. Third, I was also answerable to the text itself as a co-authored work. We never set out to write a book, but once underway, I had to remain open to the dilemmas, ambivalences and conflicts 
that inevitably arise in co-research, that project took on a life of its own and grew in its own way. My university colleagues helped us to better appreciate the problems and possibilities of authorship. Lassiter suggests that the ethics and politics of representation are truly about who has control and who has the last word. I exercised considerable control, but that freedom was entrusted to me and never replaced the right of my community co-authors to make critical decisions. The passage of time since publishing the book has freed me from my earlier allegiance to certain ideas. I stand by all our decisions except for one, the one that troubled me the most, the decision concerning the co-authorship of the poems. And really, I think that is because I am a poet at heart. What is more obvious to me now, though, is that the narratives they perform are deeply personal. They speak of other lives, not my own. It really is very simple in the end. I think in the future I would represent the collaborative authorship of such poems in this way. Matua Sam Chapman, in brackets, and Francis Hancock. Those humble brackets never occurred to me when I was mulling over this conundrum with my academic and community colleagues. Those humble brackets not only give prominence to the person whose story is told in the poem, but also recognises that someone else contributed to its production. Asserting that prominence reminds me that my work seeks to be in service of others, especially Indigenous peoples and the kinds of communities I lived in growing up. Finally, since the book was published, I have gone on to conduct further research with Matua Sam and Nanny Ann. And my being able to do that tells me the, that the Otara Book Project produced a meaningful exchange and enduring relationships. When I meet them and my other co-authors in this project, in fact, all the projects I've worked on, I can honestly say that we smile, we hug one another, and we share memories of that time we worked together. What lingers for me is a feeling of aroha, unconditional love and concern for the other. Respect for these remarkable people and gratitude for the taonga we co-produced together. I look at the cover of this book, I see its beauty and its flaws. I also remember that during this project, I experienced major eyesight problems. I had several surgeries, and in the final weeks of the book's production, I felt myself going blind because of cataracts. After one major surgery from a detached retina while lying face down on a massage table for 10 long days, it occurred to me that the collaborative text making projects I do help me and others to see the communities I work with a bit more clearly as they want to be seen against problem saturated stories and the obstacles of our own impaired sight. Whatever its flaws, this book is something of a miracle that strangers could come together and over time produce this work. This book is also beautiful. I think we created that beauty together. Noreira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll just flip back to our other minutes. Oh, okay. 
Um, that was wonderful. Thank you. And really interesting. And I'm sure there are people out there who've got things they would like to say mm. and maybe ask you. So um, if you have muted your microphone and you want to ask a question, just remember to unmute before you launch forth. But um, are there questions and comments out there in cyberspace? <laughs> we'll start. Kia Francis. Um, Kia ora, how much I enjoyed the presentation. I haven't, I haven't got any questions yet, but um, just how much I enjoyed it. Thank you. Mm. Robin. We have all weird Janine here. Oh. I have a, a question for you. Oh. That was amazing. Sorry. Mm. Um, I've just um, ordered the book from the library, so I can't wait to read it cover to cover. Yes. Thank um, you. I have a question for you about the whole... Um, your consideration of the with and the and, because that I've spent a lot of time thinking about that in the work I look at in community histories as well, for obvious reasons. Um, but as a, um, a student, I'm based in the English and Media Studies School, mm -hmm. and I was wondering to what extent in your work you engaged with life writing scholars in the debate of co-authorship and an ethical collaboration. You know, to what extent did your work look at those aspects of it, perhaps? Um, I've, I've looked at it a little bit. I, d I don't really see this as life story uh, production. Um, I think the, the communities that I'm working with are um, trying to um, speak themselves, uh, speak of their reality and who they are um, to bring that into being through the conversations we have and of course, it's about their lives, um, um, but it's also about this huge political reality that they're engaged in, that they're suffering under um, every day with the decisions that are being made at a policy level in this country that are bearing down and having a direct impact. So there's a sense in which, um, and I'll always remember Gus Autonomouk, uh, with whom I wrote the first book, and he said to me, Francis, the relationship is lovely, but my people are dying, so we have to do something together. You know, so the sense of the moral and political, ethical imperative of the relationship has always been um, very central. Um, I'm not as well versed in that literature as I'm sure you are, and you might have some observations um, to make. You know, I was talking to Lincoln before we came in here and, you know, I've just written a story about two months ago and in the first version on the front cover of it, I had, um, as told to Francis Hancock, uh, um, and I possibly will go there in the future, but actually when, the, when that story finally got um, uh, completed, I just took my name off the front cover. I just didn't feel like I needed to be there, actually. I just felt... It was really about this group of people, this amazing group and what they're doing. And it was quite okay for me just to be on the last page with my name next to Lincoln, who did the photography and the designer who sticks with me. And I sort of feel that's probably where I'm headed with the work I do, that I, I mean, these matters have been so important to me, frankly, over the years, trying to be seen, because in my family, probably I was never seen. So... <laughs> There's a lot of psychology, you know, that comes into play that's really got nothing to do with academics or, or writing or authorship. It's just trying to be seen. But, or um, hide. Or, uh, or trying to hide. Or hide, yeah. So um, I, I'm really now just much more about putting these communities front and centre as fully as I can be, while at the same time recognising that I've made a thousand decisions in the creation in the, of these books. Mm. Thanks. Robin, did you have a question or a comment you wanted to make? Um, a comment, thanks. Thanks, Deborah. So, Francis, I wanted to thank you for, you're such a thoughtful, um, for taking us through so thoughtfully of, uh, through your research process, but through your writing. I particularly appreciated the, the nuance around how you, um, co how you attributed authorship, the the with, the and, the brackets, mm. um, and this, the one you just mentioned now, the as told to, um, it would be another possibility. I think I, my um, 
work is is often about um, life writing. So the previous question um, spoke to that as well. And I mean, there's 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 all sorts of issues that come up for that. I mean, sometimes people want to protect their exactly. um, privacy. They want their story out there as. Um, they feel their story needs telling, but they don't need to put their hand up for it. Mm -hmm. um, so in a collection of stories that I have, some people are given their names, some people are given um, uh, a pseudonym, mm -hmm. depending mm -hmm. on their prominence. I, and, I mean, what I've done in the past is um, to have spoken about, written about before I present the story, the process. Mm -hmm. But I really, I know your talk has really made me think about that for the future. So I really, mm -hmm. I just want to yeah, thank you for going, going through it so thoughtfully, mm -hmm. and through your decisions. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, I, um, I, um, in all of the, the things that I've done, I've always, without knowing it, just what I said earlier, um, included a reflection on the research okay. process yeah. and generally okay. have talked about whatever decisions have been made. You know, there's nothing... Um, community, The community groups that I work with have a greater or lesser engagement in these conversations because, you know, a lot of it's quite academic at some level. And um, but and and some of it's political. I'm working on a project at the moment where I've interviewed 20, there's 24 people that have been involved in 16 interviews, and some of those um, comments are constructively critical. Um, but we may not attribute their names because that might not necessarily be a wise thing to yeah. do. Um, so I always say to people, we can do what we like, we can be flexible. So I really like the and and approach. In one of the books that I wrote, um, this very learned doctor in Wellington, who I interviewed, a GP, she had one of the, the strongest analysis of power I've ever come up across, and she talked about the and and approach. And so to just create a whole lot of um, uh, different ways of being and doing and just hold them together. You know, we don't have mm. to resolve all these contradictions. We can just allow them to be. Mm. So I quite often say to people, you can have no name, your name, someone else's name. <laughs> you can have some other reference. And we can have all of those options operating in the same text. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, I have interviewed hundreds of people and I've only ever had one person withdraw their interview. It was the Tirupu Manawan Nui book, I think. Um, and that person later, when she saw the whole text, she really, re re you know, regretted her decision. But it is just the enormity for some people about putting mm. putting these stories out there and mm. and the stories that you know, I'm telling our big stories, you know, mm -hmm. people have had, some people, horrific lives and experiences and, um, mm -hmm. you know, I remember I've, I've just always done this, you know, taken notes. So the, the only time I ever interviewed was doing my doctorate. So up until... Me two, with a recorder. With a recorder. So yeah. up until two years ago, I would only have ever taken um, very fast written notes and I was interviewing a 28-year-old Māori uh, woman who um, had had a really horrific childhood. And she said to me that, um, you know, watching you write down my story makes me think I have a story and that my story matters because mm -hmm. somebody is writing it down. Wow. And um, just in this current project I'm working on, I was having um, breakfast with these three amazing young Māori women who are just so bright, so sharp, uh, so politically astute. And we were in a cafeteria and I did have the recorder. I said, oh, I'll put it on, you know, it might work. But anyway, I was writing furiously. And of course, um, because they're Māori, they're just slipping into it all Māori. And anyway, I was it all Māori, writing it all down. And then suddenly this one across from me looks at this one over here. And she said, look what she's doing. And this one looks, peers over at the text 
and she said she's writing our words. And she said uh, she's writing our words um, in our language. And this one looked over and said, yeah, and she spelt them right. <laughs> and then I said, okay, well, girls, let's not be romantic about this. Give me about another three paragraphs and I'll be doing the Pākehā thing and asking, how do you say that? <laughs> how do I write that? And sure enough, about five minutes later, I learned my new word for the day, which is uki uki which means sustainability. Mm. So that was, mm. um, yeah. So anyway, I'm going a bit off um, script, but, um, you know, there's a lot of magic in this, this work. And in that project, um, the person funding me wants to know up front that everyone will put their names on the inside cover. And I just have refused to make that commitment until people see the whole text with their quotes in the text. And the funder is curious about why I need to do that because you wouldn't ordinarily do that. And there would be lots of projects where you couldn't do that, like writing a doctorate mm. might be one of them. Um, but in this project, it's not a huge project, so it's possible to see, for people to see not only their quotes and have those approved, but also then to see their quotes in context and then to have the freedom to decide if they want changes or if on whether or not they want to put their name to it. And there are iwi leaders that I'm interviewing on that project. And so when I first talked to them, that was what we'll see. I'll wait until I see the text before I decide. That's what they said. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I just think there's such huge politics out there in communities, oh, Yeah. you know, that we read about all this stuff in our academic works. Um, but it's very real at the coalface, um, as I'm sure you all know from your own experiences. And so I just think that going slow is the fastest way and um, we just have to be as generous as we can. Mm. Yeah, that's a good reminder and like what Robin was saying too, you know, not everything that people uh, tell you about, not all kind of projects are ones where it's appropriate to use people's names for yeah. various reasons, yeah. right? So, Sometimes they do need their confidentiality protected mm. or or whatever, mm. or, you know, many, many mm. reasons. And, of course, the other thing is that in not being in an academic position, it's interesting, normally mm. we think about being an academic as being a position of privilege, which, of course, it is mm. immense privilege, but there's some privilege you have for not mm. being an academic as well mm. in the sense mm. of the flexibility of decisions that you have mm. around downplaying your role in a way. Mm. Right. Well, it's you, yeah. um, you know, yes. like if you're an academic, you have to be there on the front of things. Yes, that's right. We're accountable, so we have to demonstrate mm, yeah. that we've made but, an account for ourselves. And now, I mean, you've got a foot in both worlds. So, mm. what would you say about that? Well, um, I just filled out a little postdoc fellowship and. Um, I was just putting in some of my publications and the feedback from one of the readers um, was, could I reorder my publications because some of them didn't seem academic? And um, I, I just feel this is very academic, this book, um, because of the work required in it. Um, and so then you just begs the question, what's academic, I suppose? Oh, sorry. I, I think I, mis yeah. I misrepresented what I was trying to say. Yeah. I wasn't meaning about the, the sort of the content of the work. Yeah. I was meaning about not being in an academic job. Yeah. Where well, we have the, you know, the requirements yeah. to, to, to publish. You know to what I mean? publish. And you've got yeah. to be, you know, first author really matters and all of yeah. those things. So yeah. I just have complete freedom, really, mm. actually. And I guess the, um, I guess... I have to just tell you that the communities I work with just love this approach. Mm. They just seem to love, because actually I'm working often with um, cultures that are not my own, so the collective we is how their worlds are constructed in the first place. So it's natural to have a group identified um, as mm. that seems quite a commonplace. Yeah. It's not an unusual thing for those projects where I would put Te Rupa Manawanui and Francis Hancock Mm. Um, and, you know, I get to make all kinds of um, 
decisions. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. I know. Mm. Which is not to say that nobody in an academic job couldn't push, you know, it's interesting to think about the ways in which you might push the boundaries yeah. around that stuff. And it's great, like everybody, a number of people have commented on your mm. the wonderful way you have walked really carefully through and given us actually probably most of us some ideas about many more ways that we've mm. thought about in the past, mm. about how you might represent co-authorship, mm. you know, and, and some of the reasons why you might. Mm. Um, other people in this room have got it want to say anything? Mm. Mm. Actually, I think you for a very um, brilliant presentation. Um, yes, my question is exactly related to this discussion, and uh, I would like to know, you know, we have, according to the human ethics uh, mm -hmm. requirement to actually um, to respect, you know, mm -hmm. um, other people in interviewish, interviews. Interviews. Mm -hmm. So how how much we have room um, mm -hmm. to, you know, um, to be actually according to this, to these um, rules of respect, generosity, and accuracy, mm -hmm. and to play with this, you know, rule between, you know, the requirement of human ethics mm -hmm. to be responsible for, you know confidentiality of the mm. actually um, subjects and at the same time we want to consider them as co-author mm. isn't it a I can't say conflict but how much uh, freedom we have to consider mm. them as a you know co-author or co-researcher mm. well it in the end, people get to decide. I guess that's the whole point, that they have the opportunity to decide. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, for my projects, I always have, um, you know, project information and I have consent forms that are very um, respectable in terms of university sort of standards. Mm -hmm. So I think we absolutely need our protocols. Um, and I think um, if we're really going to be true to relationships, we have to allow ourselves to um, revisit those protocols if we need to in the process. Mm -hmm. And sometimes things change and we have to revisit things. Um, but there are some absolute ethical standards, you know, do no harm and absolutely we have to respect um, because people, when you're engaged in very deep conversations, will tell you all manner of things that they don't intend for you to use in their research. Mm -hmm. Or they'll say things like, write what, um, don't write what I say, write what I mean to say. <laughs> so I've had that a lot over the years. Um, but I think um, what I love about co-authorship is that I don't really... Um, these days don't get too troubled because I always know um, that it's not finished until it ends in a good way. Now how we get there I don't know mm -hmm. but I know that it will be finished when it ends in a good way and I'll stay in until that happens mm -hmm. um, and that I work very closely with individuals as well as with a whole group so that individuals feel good about not only what their contribution is and how it's represented, but also if they are named as an author or not and how they want that to be. So it's not compulsory to be named. Um, and I, I just think that there's kind of huge flexibility that we can we can um, consider while we navigate this terrain that gets us out of, moves away from this terrible legacy we've had of exploiting, you know, communities. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we're still in the wake of that exploitation. It still goes on. Um, but all of us here would not want to be party to any of that. So all of us here would be wanting to work in ways that are deeply respectful of the knowledges of the people that we're working with and them and, and attribute as would be appropriate, whatever that means. I just think there's likely to be different ways of doing that um, and that the people themselves will have
something to say about it if we ask the question. Mm. Mm. Can I ask something? Mm. Sure. Yeah. Um, kia ora and thanks so much, Francis. The, um, it was really lovely to be taken through carefully and slowly through your process and thinking. Um, and I'm kind of just wanted to go back to something you comment you made before about you thought prior to your academic research you were um, dealing with issues of, of being seen or not seen. And I figure, and you said that's not that's nothing to do with academia, but I kind of I figure there's a lot about academia which is to do with that. And you name it when you're talking about discovering that the first authorship is really important. And, and in fact, I think and I've noticed particularly since coming to academia that. How, how much, how less, how generally the conditions for collaboration are, are not kind of um, lubricated, I suppose. You know, it's much easier to collaborate outside of um, institution. I, I found, at least at Victoria. Mm -hmm. um, and so this idea of being, I, I just wondered if it feels like to me there's maybe a project almost to, after you've, you know, post, post PhD, and mm -hmm. you've taken a couple of years to look at this issue of the politics of being seen, because I mm -hmm. feel like. Mm. That is a, that is still a big issue coming through um, mm. this because I think that your practice is really um, I mean, I'm interested to know if you've got a specific name for your practice that's not just researcher mm. but something that actually identifies you in it. No, I don't. So that's a good <laughs> question. <laughs> All right, well, come come back to us come on that one. Come back to that one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, good. I mean, I'm also doing a practice-based PhD, so that's kind of why I'm thinking about yeah. about these terms. Mm -hmm. But it's really important, and especially in relation to others, to notice what it is you're doing. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, um, mm -hmm. but thanks for the thanks Thank for you. being exposed to us. Yeah, and being Thank being being seen. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Well, I'll just say one thing, and, and thanks for that. Yeah, because we keep getting told that we've got a digital profile now that we're out there, oh. which is <laughs> awesome. really horrible. Um, <laughs> sorry, my red coat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but but I, I just want to say, this is another plug like Lincoln did before, but Francis has written a lot of this into a, a lovely chapter for us, and mm -hmm. that should be out early next year uh, in a book on narrative and metaphor as innovative methodologies but so she's crafted this presentation to a lovely piece that will be um, accessible next ah, year. Fantastic. Yeah. That's the basis of the chapter in this book. Fantastic. Yeah. So narrative and metaphor is the title of the book? Yeah. Narrative and metaphor, innovative methodologies and pedagogies, mm. I think it is. Trying to ask mm. what is our, the name of our book. Edited by Esther Fitzpatrick and Sandy Farquhar. That's them. Fabulous. That's them. Okay. The, the beautiful uh, coming out in two thousand and nineteen. Mm -hmm. mm. All right, watch the space. Yeah. <laughs> so put it out on the Ed Sock wheel. Yeah, yeah. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When the book comes out, yeah. you should definitely do that. Mm. Yes. Um, thanks for that. That's good. I mean, and of course, this is recorded, right? So you can listen to this later or pass the link on to other people as well, but they can't wait till 2019. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's um, right. <laughs> <laughs> now we've got a few minutes more. If there's any final questions or comments from anyone here or anywhere out there, Trudy, are you trying to speak? Hi. Um, yep, <laughs> almost. There we go. Um, I've got lots of questions. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. I, I've made lots of notes. We really appreciated it. And I was just reflecting on it's Sophie's Sophie's question and. Um, and I was thinking about some of the work you've done and thinking what happens when we name things mm. and group things and it's, it's an idea that reflects on some of the teaching that I do and some of the research that I do with the wonderful women in the room. And I'm thinking to me when you, when you were speaking you, you tell the story in such a lyrical way. Mm. You have this wonderful kind of poetic quality mm. and it feels as though it's an ontological kind of stance, a way of seeing and being in the world, mm. rather than something that can be named. And I wonder, I don't, I'm not quite sure what my question is. Mm. What would happen to what you do? Maybe this is my question. What would happen to what you do if we name it as something? 
Is that a sensical question? Mm. A fantastic question. Mm. <laughs> what do you think? I mean, you know, I think um, um, I had this experience um, actually just very recently with an iwi leader, um, and um, I went to interview him and travelled some distance and waited an hour and he didn't come, but I did wait an hour. And then I went home and there was a reason why I couldn't come, which, um, and, and, um, and so we made another time. So the following week I made the journey again and went out there. And what was sort of lovely about that experience was that I did have an hour by myself just to rest. I had taken no book so I could just read and rest and have a coffee. And, um, and then I got to show him the kind of person I am by the response I had mm. to the inconvenience of having travelled, you know, over an hour to get somewhere and then waiting an hour and then travelling an hour home about how how I could be generous and gracious mm. um, because, you know, life happens to all of us mm. and, um, and I could simply just assume that on that day it was happening to him, not me. Mm. And so the next time when we met, um, I got out there and I was about 15 minutes early and I got out of my car and I pulled myself together and I walked over to the coffee shop slowly and I saw this person and I just knew it was him, even though we'd never met. And I just had this big smile on my face and I came in and I said to him by name, addressed him by name and I said, isn't this wonderful? You are now 15, you know, you are now early waiting for me. That makes me feel really special because he only lived five minutes away. And so then we sat down and we talked for an hour about something completely unrelated to the interview that we were to have. At the end of it, he said, I had to talk about all of that before we could now talk about this. And then at the end of that period, he said that he knew he could even have that conversation because our ahua had met, our character had met. Uh, before um, I entered the coffee shop, um, our presence had met and encountered each other and had a sense of she's all right. and. Um, I, I feel in my work there's quite a lot of I say I sort of I'm reaching for the word sort of mysticism or something you know I can't quite find the right word for it but I think kind of wider or something like mm. that and um, mm. I, I think for myself as a Pākehā you know we're sort of ontologically created in one way and then I'm engaging with communities or individuals from other um, worlds that are you know, ontologically created in other ways, and really all I'm trying to be is in relation. And so, you know, for me, that's actually all it's about now, is just to be in relation, and whatever that means. Um, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to determine, and, and the people that I work with are wanting me to help them write their principles of practice, and, and now because I'm sort of just affected by these people that I've spent years talking to. I'm just really interested in sort of ways of being and ways of thinking and ways of doing and those sort of ways of expressing. Um, and I think it's possible to talk about our work through that kind of approach, to take that kind of approach. Um, but I'm not sure beyond that how much further I'd want to go, you mm. know. Because I think if you say too much, you'll kind of nail something down. And, you know, that experience that I had that I just told you about, you know, for me it was sacred. It was a sacred mm. experience. And do I even have the right to tell that story? I don't know. Um, but you just know you're in this, um, this terrain, you know. You're having one of those experiences. It's very rich and... It's, you're very honoured, actually, to because you are in some space there that's 
but certainly not your own. So, yeah. Mm. Wonderful. I think that was a very fire, fabulous question and a fabulous yeah, answer really, yeah. on mm. which to finish, actually, mm. because it, yeah. Because mm. um, I, yeah, we are out of time now, sorry, sadly. So, um, thanks everybody for attending, but especially, of course, um, to you, Francis, mm -hmm. for all the things that people have already said about what you've done in terms of your presentation and for sharing, you know, the sort of wisdom of many, many years of incredible, or well, you would say incredible privilege mm -hmm. of these experiences, but also, um, yeah, and the learning that you, you know, that you've accumulated over that time. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your attentiveness. Mm -hmm.